most uncompromising director in Hollywood and the most self-destructive. Eric von Stroheim was one of the few legitimate geniuses of the early silent days. He was a man of such vision and he was so great a poet and an artist that he had found nothing but trouble in Hollywood. <laughs> Eric von Stroheim was one of the few directors to act in many of his own films. Well, he did a lot of things in those days that nobody else put on the screen. Like in the wedding march, there's a lot of stories of getting the whole bunch of people on the set drunk and keeping them there for three days and having nearly orgies on the set. He had girls, and he didn't use any extras. He, he used pensionnaire of Madame Francis, which was a real McCoy as far as girls of ill repute. Von Stroheim began as an actor at the studio of D.W. Griffith. During World War I, he worked for Griffith as military advisor and played a Prussian officer. A role that fitted him so perfectly, he played it for the duration. From the moment he appeared on the screen, Stroheim had enormous impact. He reveled in being outrageous. He believed his press releases. The man you love to hate. He thought hate was more important than anything else. One girl said to me one day, um, does he drag you around the house by your hair every morning before he goes to work? And of course, I thought that was absolutely ridiculous because he was a very kind person. As an actor, Stroheim was always offering suggestions to the directors he worked with. This sequence contains the first hint of the Stroheim touch. A tiny detail symbolizes the corruption of innocence. Stroheim wrote a script for his first film as director. With a determination some saw as arrogance, he took it straight to the head of Universal Studios, Carl Lemley. Mr. Lemley said, if I give you a chance to direct the picture, when you become successful, you leave me and go somewhere else. He said, I'll shake hands on that and promise you I will stay with you. So he said, um, all right, what's the deal? So Lemley said, you give us the story for nothing, you direct the picture for nothing, but we'll pay you $200 a week to star in it. This was the first time in films, said Stroheim, that a man casually followed his sexual bent. Having seen me only as a brutal German officer, the public greatly resented me and the sophistication of my seduction. This man with his dirty sex stuff should be deported, they said. I became infamous and notorious. The picture was made for $42,000. And it made one of the first pictures to make over a million. The people were lined up for blocks to see it. Stroheim was rewarded with complete freedom to direct and star in Foolish Wives. The sets were on the scale of a Griffith epic. Universal City became Monte Carlo. Stroheim's films were always scrupulously authentic. He was fascinated with military detail, and his uniforms were correct to the last tunic button. Mine was a tremendous stickler for detail. 
if things went exactly the way he wanted, he wouldn't shoot. Uh, uh, at, at the time when he had rebuilt parts of the casino of Monte Carlo, absolutely to every detail. And when he came in to shoot the first day in the hall of the hotel, he suddenly walked over to the porter's uh, little desk there, and he looked at uh, the box where the numbers of the rooms showed up when, when somebody rang, and it didn't work. And he said, this, why, why doesn't this work? Numbers must show up. And I said, well, Mr. Winstrom, you're so far away. I will not shoot until this is all set. Everything had to be to, in absolute working order. Stroheim used every arc light Universal had. Lights had to be rented from other studios. The front office ordered him to stop. He had shot enough for three pictures. Stroheim ignored the order. The studio made the best of a bad job. As the cost climbed, they put it up in lights. Finally, producer Irving Thalberg ordered the cameras to be seized. After 13 months, shooting stopped. After the gala premiere in New York, Universal felt the picture was far too long. They slashed it by an hour. Despite an outcry that the film was an insult to the American people, they kept the most provocative scenes. Stroheim and the wife of the American ambassador shelter from a storm in a goat herd's hut. in film was quite uh, atrocious but he had such charm and such innate modesty actually with all of his his exhibitionism and no matter how wicked he was in the films people adored him Stroheim's films were bringing in a fortune for Universal Pictures Thalberg gave approval for his next project merry-go-round but warned him against unnecessary extravagance. He served champagne and caviar, and by God, it had to be real champagne and real caviar. I know that was quite a bone of contention at the studio. It upset Thalberg at the time terribly that there were bills for hundreds of dollars worth of caviar being served. Uh, usually they would have uh, some jam that took the place of caviar, but not for Einstein. Solberg decided that Stroheim's extravagance was inexcusable. He fired him. It was a milestone in the annals of the industry. Now the producer was in charge, not the director. June Mathis, creative head of Goldwyn Studios, disagreed. She believed that the director should have total control. She opposed the factory system and welcomed Stroheim. Stroheim saw an opportunity at Goldwyn to make the film of his dreams. He'd always wanted to film the brutally realistic novel McTeague by Frank Norris. He called it Greed. Here he demonstrates a scene to actor Jean Herschelt. He photographed the book practically from cover to cover, and everything but the preface and a, and a, a sub-story of a couple of dogs. And it was very truthfully portrayed and put on the screen, even to the locations. Stroheim's use of location was revolutionary. For this doomed love story, he filmed in real houses, real streets. I felt the public had tired of the cinematic chocolate eclairs which had been stuffed down their throats, he said. I was going to people my scenes with real men and women who conquered their passions or were conquered by them. His attention to detail surpasses that 
of any director I have ever known or heard about. His sense of drama is absolutely exquisite. He will build to his climax, he will reach that climax, and he will let that climax subside only to be taken up by another wave. It's like the rollers coming in from a heavy storm. Greed. A wife wins a lottery and becomes obsessed with hoarding the money. keeps her husband, McTeague, penniless. Zezu Pitts had been a comedienne. Stroheim tested her for the leading role. He wanted her to age with the story, but to start as an innocent young girl. Zezu was supposed to count the money, gold pieces, and Stroheim wanted her to have an expression as if she had an orgasm and she didn't know what he was talking about. So the funny thing is, he was trying to show her how to do it by mimic him. And, uh, and we, of course, the whole company laughed, but he got his test all right and she got the job. Strohheim's version of greed lasted 42 reels. To show greed in its entirety would take all afternoon and all evening and would be a long afternoon and a long evening. And it would exhaust any audience. He knew he was making a masterpiece. Every scene showed it. He knew that he was making a financial flop because the ex extreme length prohibited being shown in any theater. And unless the thing is shown in the theater for money and makes money, then it is a failure. No matter how good it is, it's still bad. Now the Goldwyn Company merged with Metro and Mayer an event which devastated both the film and Stroheim's career. Two men dedicated to the factory system now controlled the company, Irving Thalberg and Louis B. Mayer. Thalberg insisted on greed being cut from 42 reels to 10. Stroheim was appalled. A critic who saw the full version described it as the greatest film he had ever seen, but Thalberg's cuts were made. Carefully plotted motivations were removed, and with them, sequences of beauty and power. Stroheim refused to look at the final result. The man who cut my film, he said, had nothing on his mind but a hat. Stroheim was now just another contract director at MGM. He clashed with the front office again over his next film, The Merry Widow. He hated the star system, but was obliged to work with May Murray, the most temperamental star of them all. Despite furious rows, he turned in a film which was highly profitable for the studio. He loathed it. He marched out of MGM. He was flawed by living the character he portrayed a great deal, too. He, uh, he didn't have the saving grace of uh, the Anglo-Saxon common sense, to put it bluntly. And uh, he was always on, and he was always uh, uh, against the management, <laughs> wherever he was. Didn't matter and he was going to wreck them. If they thought they had suffered before, he was going to show them real suffering. Mm -hmm. 
Backed by an independent producer, Stroheim embarked on The Wedding March. Again, he shot enough for two films, only one of which was ever shown in the United States. Once again, he was taken off the production. Why did he do it? There's only one answer, and I can't guarantee it. But it is an inward impression that somewhere early in his life, he was visited by such very great humiliation, such deep inward psychic wounds, that there came in him an insane desire to use his genius as a weapon. And that he would use the beauty of his work as bait to make them put out thousands, then hundreds of thousands, then millions, and more millions, until he had a beautiful, magnificent monstrosity that is worthless except as a curiosity piece. And he had his vengeance. He proved his genius, and he had his revenge all at one fell swoop. Stroheim had one more chance. Gloria Swanson hired him to direct Queen Kelly. Joseph Kennedy backed it, but no matter how much money he poured in, Stroheim spent more. We worked from 7.30 in the morning until 3 in the morning every night for seven months. And on Saturday, he would say, now let's celebrate, tomorrow is Sunday. I said, what do you mean tomorrow is Sunday? Today is Sunday. And he had a big... Uh, flask, about a gallon flask, and he would get my whole crew drunk. Gloria Swanson played an orphan, abducted from a convent by Prince Wolfram who cannot face his marriage to the crazed and jealous queen, played by Sina Owen. gone way over budget and we had 20,000 feet that had to be cut down to 3,000. So, and what he started to do in this, the last part of the picture, not the last part, but the middle of the picture, the second third of it, was I knew censorable. Because in the script it said a dance hall. And by the time he got through and I looked at the rushes and everybody else did, they said, this is no dance hall. This is something else. These sequences were cut from the film and never shown. Ali Marshall was playing a very strange African owner of the place of ill repute, and he was going to marry Swanson, who was supposed to be a girl about 18, and uh, he had one of those safari jackets, and in one pocket full of a lot of cigars, and the other one a bottle of cognac, in another part was a gun, and he was chewing tobacco. All of a sudden, 
tobacco spit <laughs> ran down on, uh, for, on his chin and it fell on Swanson's hand. And she said, Mr. Marshall. And he said, I'm sorry, Miss Swanson. This is what Mr. Fudge thought I wanted. So I walked off the set and said no more shooting. And she went to the phone and called the pass to be, I think she called Mr. Kennedy in, in Florida. He was our producer. And uh, 10 minutes later, Kennedy called Strohheim and fired it. And that was the end of Strohheim and Queen Kelly. Queen Kelly was never shown in the United States. Stroheim's career as a director came to an end. After an attempt to make a sound film, he resorted to acting and eventually exiled himself to France. Lights! In 1949, he returned. He was cast opposite Gloria Swanson, playing a failed silent film director. Where am I? This is the staircase of the palace. Oh, yes, yes, down below, they're waiting for the princess. I'm ready. All right, cameras, act! As he lay dying, Stroheim told his biographer, this is not the worst. The worst is that they stole 25 years of my life.